Hi, welcome to Actual LOL. I'm John Perkis. I played 165 board games that were released in 2019, which is a stupid amount. I wouldn't recommend it. But I would recommend the 10 games in this video which were my favourites of the year. If you'd like to buy any of them, there are links in the description below. Sushi Roll is a dice game about eating sushi, with such a perfect name that you can't help but feel the makers of 2014's Sushi Dice should all retire in shame. You're at a sushi restaurant and you're trying to grab the best sushi off the conveyor belt because you want to have a better meal than your friends. And a bigger house. And more attractive children. It's a sequel to the game Sushi Go, replacing the cards with dice. And it's remarkable how big of a difference that change makes. Everything is now out in the open, which means you can see what's coming up on the conveyor belt and plan your decisions around it. It's no longer a shot in the dark to take a sashimi if you can see there are others in the game to complete your set. But it's still a big gamble because when the conveyor belts move, you have to roll your new dice. They're colour coded so you always have an idea of what you'll get, but no guarantee. You get that buzz of clinging to a hope of what might be and never getting what you want. It's like an election. With the sushi out on the table, not kept secret in a hand of cards, it's a more social experience because you watch what other players take and whether they've left anything good for you. These chopsticks let you swap a dice with someone else's conveyor belt for when you really need to complete a set. Or if the dice aren't giving you what you want, you can spend reroll tokens for a desperate last ditch attempt. I love gambling on trying to collect the best set because if you do, it feels like pulling off a full house in poker. And if you don't, you're not too sad because you know you'll pull it off next time, right? The dice have somehow made the game more exciting and more strategic than Sushi Go, which it's replaced as one of my go-to games to play with newbies. But if the publisher Game Right doesn't release an expansion with more types of Sushi Dice to play with, I will personally soak their contact lenses in wasabi. The short-sighted bastards. Age of Dirt is the name I gave my teenage years till I went to college and entered the Stone Age. Speaking of which, in 2008, the board game Stone Age was a smash hit, a game about building up your tribe by hunting for food and sending two people into a tent to make a baby. Now in 2019, we have Age of Dirt, a game about building up your tribe, hunting for food and sending two people into a tent to make a baby. But before the old fogies peek their head around the door saying that they used to play games like that when they were our age, I would like to point out that, shut up dad, you just don't get it. To build up your tribe, you need to send workers to get resources such as food, stone, pelts, and wood. In Stone Age, you'd roll dice for each worker you sent. The more you send, the better your chances of return. Your dad thought that was really cool back in 2008. In Age of Dirt, your workers are thrown into a meeple tower. For every worker that falls out the bottom, you get a resource. It doesn't take a genius to calculate that a meeple tower is eight times cooler than dice. It's simpler, you don't have to do any mental arithmetic. And it creates funnier moments, like when you send a worker hunting but they get stuck in the tower and fall out later during a forest action, giving you some berries instead. It's so entertaining and such a communal experience because everyone is invested every time the tower gets used. Like when the love tent gets activated. If two of your tribesfolk come out, you get a baby a new meeple to put straight to work. But if only one of yours comes out, you can agree to mate with another tribe singleton. And if that's not an option, your lonely lover decides to focus on their work instead, and you can send them off to do another action for free. Add to that the threat of the saber-toothed tiger who roams the plains and gets thrown in when you go hunting for pelts. If he falls out the tower, he eats one meeple from each tribe, unless you have a spear to protect yourself. If he doesn't fall out this time, then he stays in there as a threat ready to pop up later to kill some unsuspecting lovemakers. Age of Dirt, a game of uncivilization, is my kind of strategy game. It takes the basics of a Euro game and adds to it a touch of spectacle. And it has fun with it. Every card is a ridiculous pun like Cavanova and the Patriarch. But there's still lots to consider, like how to spread your workers, jumping into a box just before you think someone will throw it in the tower, or doing it yourself to get the bonus. Each objective card you complete gives you an ability or a discount, and there's that classic feeling of wanting to do everything now and hating yourself for not upgrading your cave or spear sooner. It's not going to appeal to gamers who want strategic depth, but if you want a light-hearted social game with big moments, Age of Dirt is one of a kind and I'm delighted it exists. Last year I raved about Spring Meadow, the purest distillation of Uwe Rosenberg's Tetris games. This year Rosenberg's returned resolved to render my ramblings redundant 
by producing an 80% proof shot of Tetris, fit for its Russian ancestry. He stripped out all of the vulgar extravagances of modern gaming, the tiles, the boards, the theme, and left us with nothing but a square of paper and a deck of cards, all we've ever needed or deserved. Flip two cards and draw one of the shapes onto your sheet of paper. Flip two more and go again. The challenge is in not screwing yourself over for future rounds, making sure you've got space when two massive shapes get flipped over, because you have to draw one. If you can't, your game is over. Well, not quite. You are given a second chance. One extra flip. If you can fit that shape in, you're back in the game. If you can't, you're done. It's a fun reveal as everyone watches to see if you'll make it through to the next round. It feels like you're trying to survive. You just made it over the last wave, but you have no idea how big the next one will be until it hits. The obvious tactic is to always pick the smaller shape each round. Keep your sheet as empty as possible, but the game is wise to your cowardice because once the deck runs out, it's all over. The player with the least empty spaces on their sheet wins, and if there's a tie, the win goes to the player who dropped out first, the one who bravely took the bigger pieces early on. As the game reaches the end, everyone is begging for certain shapes to come out, because these reference cards tell you what shapes you can expect. They let you plan. If you're about to put in an awkward shape that leaves an annoying gap, are there enough small shapes that haven't come up yet to fix it later? Uwe Rosenberg knows how to make Tetris puzzling fun. It's like a male model, he'll look good in layers and layers of clothing like in Feast for Odin, or strip him down to just his underpants in Second Chance, and you'll see that it's still rock solid. His abs, that is. It's hard to see where Rosenberg will go next from here, but if Uva's oeuvre is over, this is a great way to finish it. <laughs> Only in board games will I ever be a superhero or a criminal, or someone that walks for hours without needing to get somewhere. I'd rather wait for paint to die than go hiking. But sitting at home pretending to do it in parks is fun. The goal is to collect sunshine, rain, trees and mountains to cash in for park cards. To collect tokens, you walk along the trail, taking the action where you stop. But where to stop? The trail is chock-a-block with other hikers and you can only stop on a free space. Those other mofos are giving you FOMO, so you're inclined to skip half the trail to get onto the one you really want before someone else grabs it. The pace is set by your impatience because the last hiker left is forced to go home. The game is doing everything it can to hurry you along by giving free tokens to the first player to reach a spot and discounts for finishing the trail first. It's a constant balance between leisurely strolling, trying to take in as much of the scenery as possible, and a ruthless get in, get what you need and get out strategy, treating nature like a shopping mall on Christmas Eve. Always with an eye on your rivals to see if they're gonna snatch the park you want from under your nose. I love a game that breeds mistrust and resentment, the feelings I held towards my dad when he dragged me hiking. Yet once you're finished, the endorphins and the Mars bar kicks in and it didn't seem so bad after all. Parks is a great little strategy game and unlike any other game in my collection. <laughs> Deep Blue was this year's big family game from Days of Wonder and boy, spelt with a U, did it make a splash. It's push your luck, but not as we know it. You sail out into the ocean and dive for treasure. You will dive with other players, but only the dive leader decides how deep you go. So added to the usual worry of going bust is the stress of whether the player in charge is a reckless maniac. You could find a bunch of treasure and have it taken away from you because the leader pushes too far. And maybe they did it on purpose to stop you getting rich. Because even though you all went on the same dive and found the same treasure, you'll all come away with different levels of wealth. If you turn up to a dive site early, you can pick a scouting spot. And if that treasure comes out the bag, you get more for it than everyone else. The whole table watches the drama unfold and everyone has a different take on the outcome. An incredible dive for one player could be a washout for another because you can go bust at different times. I love the way the card system works. You can choose to play defensively and buy crew to protect you from going bust or focus on scoring more points. The really cool bit is the timing of when you have them in your hand. Let's say someone starts a dive in an adjacent spot. You can choose to join in, but if you just come off another dive where you've exhausted your crew cards, you won't have them available until you rest. Resting takes a whole turn and you draw three of your used cards. Towards the end of the game, there's this tense game of chicken that gets played. You're all gearing up for the last dive and if you want it to be a big success, you'll need all your crew cards in play. So you take turns resting. Or do you? Because being the one to start the dive gives you extra points and puts you in control. I fell in love with Deep Blue on my first play. It's such a fresh take on Push Your Luck 
and has so many moments of triumph and abject failure. If you'd like to learn about the games that almost made it into my top 10, I've shared my numbers 20 to 11 in my monthly newsletter, which is exclusive to my Patreon backers. You can support me making these videos and hear about games I don't talk about on the channel by pledging at patreon.com forward slash actual There's a link below. Right, let's carry on with the list. I just want to say up front, I'm friends with one of the three designers of this game, Anthony Howardjago. This is him at my wedding. I just thought it was worth mentioning in case there's any unconscious favoritism at play. But I would point out that he had to leave my wedding early because he'd left the key to his Airbnb apartment halfway across London. So there's also some conscious resentment thrown in there too. Rush MD is a real-time cooperative game about running a hospital. You know, one of those places where if you forgot a key, people would die. And it's a sequel to one of my favorite games of all time, Kitchen Rush. You're racing to save lives, playing against a four minute timer, but everything you need to do takes time. The doctors and nurses you move around the hospital are sand timers. You have to wait for their sand to run out before you can get them to do something else. You have to admit patients into your wards, run tests on them, perform surgery and give them medicine. It's stressful, chaotic and thematic, just like Kitchen Rush. But it also comes with some changes that improve on the original. You share your patients amongst all the players, moving them around in these cardboard beds. For example, my friend Anthony might give the patient an x-ray, then I take over to perform the surgery because Anthony will probably leave his keys in the patient's chest cavity, then someone else can play nurse to give them the drugs they need. It's nice because it forces you to work together. You only have one doctor sand timer each, and if the patient needs two diagnostic tests, it's quicker if you share the workload. Plus, it gives me a reason to shout at my friends, get me 10 mgs of lidocaine, stat, which is one of the things on my bucket list, and makes a change from me shouting, why did you leave my wedding early? The other big change is that they've added a dexterity element to the game. When you're performing surgery, you can't touch anything with your hands. You have to use these tweezers instead. And good luck trying to pick up this smooth-sided heart in a hurry. The pressure of the timer makes you rush, which of course means you make a mistake so that it takes even longer. And to give patients drugs, you have to inject them by taking the right colored medicine and putting it into these plastic syringes. When I first saw these, I thought they were a silly addition, but they actually really work as another way to slow you down and give the game some variety. Rush MD is probably the most intense, action-packed, collaborative real-time game there is. And I just love the theme. I entered 2019 ready to give up on roll and rights, with all the chances of a person trying to give up donuts with their taste buds still intact. How could this winning formula that has produced so many games I really enjoy possibly inspire another game I enjoy, I thought with my stupid brain. And so publisher Board Game Tables, a name that inspires trust issues, released On Tour, a fiendish game about touring the United States with your band, which you still might do one day. Your job is to create a tour route of numbers across the map in ascending order. Each turn, the dice give you two numbers to place and the cards tell you where you can place them. It's like dealing with two polar opposite parents. You've got the dice who are drunk half the time, throwing random numbers at you, and the strict cards who give you three options and you hate all of them. It's a really engrossing challenge and it's simple enough to give the illusion that you could pull it off. But every round the dice do their impression of Yoko Ono grabbing the wheel of your tour bus and mess with your plans. As you get closer to the end of the game, you're just praying for the dice to give you one of the numbers you need to salvage half the board. There are moments of peace when you roll doubles and get to place a wild number down as the whole table breathes a sigh of relief. It's those moments of kindness from the game, just like in Pandemic, that really bring out the Stockholm Syndrome. My favorite thing about On Tour is how much the game encourages you to take risks and then punishes you for it. You can get extra points by putting numbers into the specific city written on each card, which tricks you into undermining your grand plan. But you know that now, so you won't do it. Well, one or two little ones won't hurt, will it? Like all my favorite roll and writes, On Tour is a masterclass in delivering frustration with less instructions than a wardrobe. Unless you buy your wardrobes pre-built like you're the Marquis of Rochester. <laughs> Legacy games terrify me. Having to schedule 15 game nights with the same three friends doesn't even bear thinking about. What if one of them dies halfway through? Or worse, has kids? Based on our current rate of progress, my Risk Legacy group will finish our campaign in 2030 by which point we'll have to burn it for fuel in the great winter. So it's frankly terrible news that two of my favorite games of last year are legacy games. 
Up first is Clank Legacy Acquisitions Incorporated, a collaboration with webcomic Penny Arcade's D&D podcast series Acquisitions Incorporated. Specific. The original Clank sent you into a dungeon to steal from a dragon. The more you steal, the more noise you make, and the more likely you are to be killed. The fun of it is in how cheeky you can be and still get away with your life. And for three years, I've been in love with Clank. I thought it was everything that I ever wanted in a game. Then on the eve of our wedding, I find out that Clank has a sister, Clank Legacy. Just as clever and fun to be with, but somehow fixes flaws I never even noticed in my bride. And so I call off the wedding and run off with this Pippa Middleton of a game instead. Clank Legacy transforms that basic fantasy premise into a vibrant world. You're now a franchise of Acquisitions Incorporated, a band of professional thieves, and you're up against the dragon Malathrex, who has a cult of lunatics worshipping him. Plus, your CEO has an evil sister with a rival corporation, and you'll meet wizards and dukes and elves, and with each encounter, you get a taste of the world. And every time, it's a delight. Unlike some stories you find in board games, written by a game designer with a mass degree, you can tell that this has been written by the people behind one of the most popular webcomics of all time. It's funny. And that's coming from an insecure comedy writer who won't laugh at jokes in public in case it inspires a comedy career more successful than mine. The board evolves as you stick new towns and castles to the map, and you'll be ripping up plenty of cards as an offering to our god, Rob Davio. It's nothing new for a legacy game, but it hits all the right spots, giving you that personal connection that comes from naming towns after the snack you're eating because you're not creative under pressure. But those constant changes come at the cost of a much longer game time, three hours on average with all the extra setup and admin. But they balance it out a little by keeping the campaign at a less daunting 10 games. If you love original Clank, this is definitely worth your time. Let's make a bus route. Might be the least exciting invitation since Let Us Pray and Let's Do The Time Warp Again, but it's also one of the best flip and write games ever made. Most and write games are lonely affairs. You each stay within the confines of your personal paper with no concept of what the other players are up to. Like a group of commuters all driving alongside each other every day in separate cars, never even learning each other's names. Let's Make a Bus Route brings everyone together by having you draw on a shared board, like commuting to work on a bus. Okay, so you still don't know each other's names, but you can smell who didn't brush their teeth this morning. As your bus winds the streets of Kyoto, you want to pick up tourists, then score them by dropping them off at landmarks, ferry kids to school, give old people a place to sit, and take commuters to train stations. It dangles the promise of points in five different directions, and you buckle under the excitement, half assing all of them, because your mum let you play with too many toys at once as a child. In your quest for perfection, or question, as I like to call it, you're encouraged to sacrifice points by paying to change the shape that you can draw that round. You've got a private goal you're clinging to whilst racing to be everyone else to hit certain landmarks. And if another player has already used a street that you're going down, you create traffic. The player who caused the most traffic is docked points. There's loads to consider, but with the simplicity you expect from a roll and write game. The shared board is a complete game changer. I bet American publishers are kicking themselves that they haven't come up with the idea of passing it off as their own already. Did you know in the USA they think the song Year 3000 is by the Jonas Brothers? Sacrilege. It's a hard game to get a hold of right now, but I'm hopeful that if some big shot handsome board game reviewer shouts about it loud enough, the industry will listen. So Quinns, if you're watching this, please make it happen. Even I look at this list and groan at three more roll and rights and three sequels to existing games. It's easy to iterate, but for the industry to progress, someone has to try something new. My number one game stands out because it's different. King's Dilemma is a narrative-driven legacy game about running a fictional country in a medieval-inspired universe. Each player represents a house that sits on the small council in charge of governing the nation. It's your collective duty to make the big decisions. Decisions that will cause starvation, death, rioting, and some things that politicians don't want to happen. Each game is a series of yes or no decisions. Do you pardon the killer who was protecting his family? Do you rebuild the windmill so the people don't go hungry? Do you allow the military to desecrate a temple just to keep the people safe? The dilemmas each build on a remarkable universe that reveals itself through each encounter. It makes you care about the local religion, history, and politics by giving you a human story to get invested in and asking you to adjudicate. 
If I'm going to decide whether someone lives or dies, I want to know the context. And you care because you've seen what your decisions can do. Doing something as simple as sending guards to arrest a witch could unlock a whole new storyline. It tells you to open an envelope, which adds new dilemmas to the game. But what that means is there's a whole other envelope that will never be open for if you've chosen not to arrest the witch. It's like if the Gwyneth Paltrow film Sliding Doors had someone who practices witchcraft in it. No way, it's like the film Sliding Doors. Even if the decision seems obvious, making things go your way isn't. The voting system is clever. Everyone has a vote, but you can spend your political power to weigh things in your favor. You don't have to convince everyone to be on your side, just bid until they forget their morals or bribe them with money. And the way that the game pits you against each other is beautiful. You each have house objectives. Some will want to see the country's economy or welfare suffer. Others want it to prosper. But each game you have a short-term personal objective which might even be at odds with that. And then you've got your own personal morals to reckon with. King's Dilemma asks some big questions and it's incredible how much it pulls at your own values. It may surprise you to learn that I, John Perkis, don't want to let peasants starve but my house in the game loves it. More than once I've ignored my goals for the sake of the greater good. And the reason for that goes deeper than starvation equals bad, it's because you feel the weight of shaping a nation, you see the impact you're having, and my natural instinct is to help it thrive, just like how I want my Sims family to get the best jobs and be happy. And even if you do have a wipe clean conscience, the game doesn't let you forget your sins with its genius sticker system. If you pass a law or make a scientific discovery, you sign your name to a sticker. The country will feel that benefit in future games. And if you force through attacks on the poor, the people will remember, so that in the next few games, if welfare continues to suffer, you'll lose points for it. No game has ever made me feel like this before. The other day I was at a meetup group playing on a table next to a group playing King's Dilemma, which is as terrifying as being friends with someone who'd read the Game of Thrones book back in 2011. I didn't get spoiled, but I did overhear them talking about a group of people from the world. And I felt a pang of guilt because of what our game group had done to those people. And each time we've played, I've wondered what would have happened if things had gone the other way. Just like in real life, I'll never find out. But no one can stop me keeping myself awake at night thinking about it, no matter how much I pay them. This is the best storytelling board game I've ever played, and it's not even close. Most games feel like you're pausing a normal board game to read a cutscene, with that jarring shifting graphics that kills the immersion. In King's Dilemma, the story is at the heart of every decision, and it's well written, thought provoking, and to the point, it knows to show, not tell. You can feel that this is a game designed for legacy, not retrofitted, but to call it legacy is underselling it. This is a new system. Every time I come away fizzing with excitement at the potential of it, this would make the best Game of Thrones narrative game, or imagine it tackling the Mass Effect universe. Better yet, a real world UN in an alternate history or in the near future. It could be applied to anything. You could be members of a local council in a Stranger Things inspired town, or even better, a parent teacher association running a school dealing with real life issues. I would play absolutely anything with this writing team behind it. If it sounds like your kind of thing, it's in my personal interest as a gamer to encourage you to get King's Dilemma. A game like this is a big effort and we have to show them it's worth it. So I present you with your own dilemma. You can buy another Star Wars game and change nothing, or you can reward a publisher for trying something different and invest in a future that contains great storytelling games. Voting with our wallet is powerful. Sherlock Holmes Consulting Detective was the same great game back in 1983, but it wasn't until Shut Up and Sit Down reviewed it and Demand Shot Up that the publishers saw its potential and gave it a glamorous reprint. Then some other publishers saw its success and created Chronicles of Crime and Detective, and now we can't breathe for crime solving games. The best board game of 2019 is King's Dilemma. And forget what I said about sequels, I'll see you back here in 2021 to talk about Queen's Dilemma. I already know how I'll vote on the Prince Andrew card. Those were my favorite board games of last year. If you'd like to buy any of them, there are links below. And if you wanna find out which games I rank 20 to 11, they're in the newsletter I write for my Patreon backers, who are the reason this channel exists. You can pledge at patreon.com forward slash actualol. If you're new to the channel, please subscribe to see more videos like this. I'm John Perkis, thanks for watching.